So, so that first part of the talk was just a very broad overview. The second part will be a more kind of detailed thing about uh, research that my own lab has been involved with. Um, so like I said, so the spindle self ordinary subcellular structure that segregates chromosomes during cell division. It also positions the cleavage plane. Um, so the spindle, like I said, is composed of microtubules. So in human tissue culture cells, spindles contain roughly 10,000 microtubules. And um, uh, the, certain microtubules contact a region on chromosomes called the kinetochore. And these so-called kinetochore microtubules are the microtubules which connect uh, to chromosomes. All right, so as I said before, microtubules and uh, spindles continue to grow, shrink, and slide, even as spindles stay uh, constant size and shape. All right, so our understanding of spindle mechanics in human cells has been limited by a lack of information on spindle structure. Um, that's been true for a long time, but it's now, now things are different. Uh, thanks to work by Thomas mueller Reichart, uh, Gunnar Fabig, and, and Robert, um, uh, who did these following uh, really phenomenal experiments. They did the first large-scale, uh, essentially total EM reconstruction of, of spindles in human cells by serial suction electron tomography. So what they did is that they have uh, 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 human cells, they um, freeze them at high pressure, and while they're frozen, they switch the uh, the frozen the, the vitreous uh, uh, water for for plastic. They cut these plastic this um, the cell, which is down plastic, in three hundred nanometer thick sections. They do tomography on each one of those sections, and they track the microtubules uh, totally in, in in each one of those sections. Then they do thirty, roughly speaking, of these sections consecutively, and they stitch all the microtubules together. Um, and by doing that, they get a total EM reconstruction of the entire spindle in human cells. Um, and here one can see every single microtubule in the spindle, and one can see its exact conformation um, and exact, exact length and exact trajectory. Um, and so here, this is an example of one of these spindles where the microtubules, uh, the kinetic core microtubules are in red, the non kinetic ones are in blue. This is just, in my mind, completely amazing. Phenomenal data, and there's just a huge amount to learn from this. All right, so so uh, we've been analyzing this data and trying to combine uh, with uh, measurements from light microscopy to learn about different uh, things in the spindle, including including the behavior of kinetic core microtubules. That's not what I'm going to talk about right now. I'll talk about um, other uh, analysis which we've been involved with. All right, and so. Um, Will Conway, who was a graduate student in my lab, who's now a postdoc jointly between uh, Flatiron and, 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 and the New York uh, uh, Structural Biology Center, one thing which he did is just try to analyze or try to understand the, what sets determines the orientation of microtubules in the spindle. And so he just looked at these EM reconstructions and then just asked what's the orientation of microtubules kind of everywhere. Um, and so here is, um, for display purposes, kind of a 2D projection where you can see microtubules kind of near the pole right here, you know, are oriented up over here, kind of down over here. Um, and on, the, on, the, on this other pole, they're, you know, up over here, down over here. Um, in the middle, they're, they're more horizontal. And so uh, uh, Thomas's group got uh, data from three, three cells. And so Will took those and averaged them together and then calculated the orientation of microtubules everywhere throughout the spindle. And that's what you're observing here. And then the question that we had was, what are some mechanics of microtubule organization and in fact, spindle morphology more broadly? All right. So, um, all right. So yeah, what, you know, what determines how microtubules are oriented in the spindle and the whole shape of the spindle? All right. So we wanted to make an analogy, or we thought to try to make an analogy with liquid crystal droplets. All right. So what do I mean by that? So if you just take uh, rod-like molecules and you know mix them up, they'll spontaneously form shapes that kind of look reminiscent to the spindle. Uh, this is true for inorganic rod-like molecules. It's also true for, you know, if you take actin filaments and, and mix them with, with PEG, uh, they also form shapes that are highly reminiscent of the spindle. And here the basic idea is that on the one hand, you have a surface tension because the molecules want to bind each other that wants to make those kind of a round droplet. But on the other hand, the, 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 the filaments all want to align relative to each other, and that wants to extend the, the, this, and then you get some balance, which, which, which uh, you know, looks like you know, what you see here. All right. However, of course, these examples are passive liquid crystal droplets, 
Well, as we said before, the spindle is an active liquid crystal. And again, to be super, um, I don't know, beat a dead horse, I guess. What I mean by that is that in these passive liquid uh, crystal cases, all you have is conservative forces and friction and drag. Well, in the case of the spindle, you have molecular motors, microtubules growing and shrinking and nucleating, all of which use chemical energy. All right, so people have formulated, as I alluded to before, continuum theories for both active liquid crystals and passive liquid crystals. And in general, both of these could be quite complex. But it's possible to argue that in the appropriate limit um, uh, that's actually relevant for the spindle, the, the equation which governs the orientation of microtubules is very, very simple. So essentially, if in the spindle, microtubules are very highly aligned, which they are, and if you have no hydrodynamic flows, which we believe you don't, then the theory just reduces to del squared n equals zero, where n is a, a unit vector, which indicates the orientation of microtubules at a certain position inside the spindle. And this is an equation that tells you about the orientation inside the spindle All right, of microtubules. All right, and in fact, in some limit, even for passive liquid crystals, you can get um, a similar a similar thing. All right, and, and this is a theory, the, the way to think about it, in which microtubules simply want to locally align relative to each other, and it honestly doesn't really matter why they want to do that, if that's due to molecular motors or cross-linkers or steric interactions or whatever, on kind of large enough lane scales or long enough time scales, one would expect um, uh, 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 these type of um, this simple equation to hold. Right, but does it hold for the actual spindle? All right, so Will thought to test that on the following way. He thought to kind of write down a active liquid crystal theory of the orientation of microtubules and the morphology of the spindle and see if it works and actually, you know, describes data. And he did that in the following way. So he says, so first he assumes the spindle is an ellipse because the spindle is an ellipse. Um, and then he says, all right, he's going to plus put two plus one defects um, where the centrosomes are and saying the microtubules want to radiate out from those, um, kind of, you know, as, a, yeah, want to radiate a, away from those. And then he just assumes that the microtubules want to orient um, parallel to the surface of the spindle. And then just numerically solves del squared n equals zero everywhere with those boundary conditions. Um, and then by hand simply moves the position of the defects of the poles of the centrosomes, if you will, to, to, to see where he can get them to align with the, um, uh, to, to best agree with the, um, uh, uh, the results from the uh, EM. Uh, and this is a prediction shown here. All right, so, so uh, to be a little bit more quantitative or precise about it, so here we have the orientation of microtools measured throughout the spindle by electron microscopy. We also did quantitative polarized light microscopy and did similar measurements. And then we'll do this active liquid crystal uh, theory. And if you do cuts at different positions throughout the spindle or across the spindle, you can see quantitative agreement between the electron microscopy, the quantitative polarized light microscopy, and the theory basically everywhere. All right, so there's agreement between the measurements and theory. And this is really remarkable because this prediction only depends on boundary conditions and um, uh, the defect positions and de doesn't depend on any parameters of the theory at all. Yet you still have quantitative agreement. And this really argues that, again, the orientation of microtubules in the spindle is set by their uh, local and mutual uh, uh, alignment. So just locally, microtubules want to line up relative to each other, and that's essentially sufficient to explain their orientation everywhere throughout the spindle. Okay, but what states the actual shape of the spindle boundary? Right. In other words, the spindle is an ellipse, but what determines its aspect ratio? All right. From this perspective, you could get you would guess kind of three possible contributions. One, you have a surface tension, right? So microtubules in the spindle want to bind each other. This, you know, due to cross-linking molecular motors, this would produce a surface tension, which would want to, want to, wants to make the spindle round. Then, you know, you have pneumatic elasticity. Microtubules want to uh, orient relative to each other. That would want to kind of extend the spindle. And then you have active stresses due to molecular motors, and that could uh, want to extend or contract the spindle depending on their sign. All right. Okay. So the re um, but how do we know which of these is really you know uh, the most important one, uh, or you know, what's the right balance? Okay. 
uh, and ends up that the relation looking at the relation between spin to aspect ratio and size can provide insight. So what do I mean by that? So I mean, so let's first consider what's relevant for an equilibrium liquid crystal droplet. In an equilibrium liquid crystal droplet, um, well, actually, in general, that can be actually really complicated, but in certain limits, even in that case, it can be complicated, but in certain limits, um, uh, that's, that uh, shape is, is set by a balance between surface tension and pneumatic elasticity, like I was alluding to before. This is a study, this is a problem which has been studied by many people, including uh, uh, Paul Vandershoot has done a lot of work on this. And here's just, a, I mean, he's done a lot of more detailed work. This is just a simple scaling argument. You can just write down the, uh, essentially the form of the free energy for surface tension, for pneumatic elasticity, balance those. And that gives a relationship, a particular relationship between the aspect ratio of the droplet and its volume. And, you know, for passive liquid crystals, this is data from the Zonimir Dojic. Uh, for uh, uh, virus particles and, and uh, depletant. And qualitatively, you can see it's, you know, qualitatively consistent with this type of theory in, in which uh, the aspect ratio is set by, the aspect ratio of the droplet is set by a balance of surface tension and elasticity. All right, what about actual spindles? So in human tissue culture cells, spindles are kind of screwed up, honestly, uh, and therefore there can be all different sizes. And, but Will took advantage of that. So he measured spindles of all different sizes in the same tissue culture cells and just asked, what's the relationship between aspect ratio and volume? And here's his data and here's the kind of fit to this theory, which, you know, isn't so great. Um, uh, but it gets one data point. Uh, but but OK, right. OK, so, so, so this probably isn't the explanation for human spindles. But an alternative explanation where you uh, suggest that the aspect ratio of the spindle is set by a balance between extensile active stresses, which want to elongate the spindle, and surface tension, which wants to make it round, predicts uh, a different relationship between, as between um, aspect ratio and volume. And actually, this theory does describe uh, the data in human tissue culture cells quite well. And uh, actually, by fitting this theory to this data, uh, or the yeah theory to the data, uh, uh, Will can extract the one parameter that is involved in this, which is essentially a ratio between active stresses and surface tension. So you can get a number out from that. In this case, it's the order. It's just this ratio ends up having units of micron, so it's just one micron. Now, one thing which is quite interesting, then Will can now start inhibiting things and asking what's their impact. For example, if he partially inhibits kinesin five not enough to get a monopolar spindle, but enough to like just inhibit it slightly, right? He sees that this ratio increases. If he partially inhibits dynin, he sees that this ratio decreases. That's consistent with kinesin-5 generating an extensile active stress that's trying to elongate the spindle. And it's cons consistent with dynein either impacting surface tension or having a contractile um, uh, 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 active stress. And Will has, in fact, done many more uh, uh, perturbations as well. Okay, so I think that's great. We were very excited by that. But we really want to further test this kind of active liquid crystal theory. And uh, that's what Surya Amada, who's, who's a postdoc at Flatiron, has done. So what do I mean by that again? So this active liquid crystal theory, what I showed you before, can explain the average orientation of microtools throughout the spindle. But what about deviations away from the average? Okay. So for example, you know, if you look on the spindle, like, you know, you have some average orientation everywhere, which I'm illustrating here by blue lines, but then for any given microtubule, it's not what that average is, right? So you have some deviation of the orientation uh, from, 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 the, from the average. All right, now it ends up that if you have a theory of active liquid crystals, you can actually predict um, what those deviations should be like. And so what I mean by that again, so, one can say, if you're just not at steady state, but you allow for fluctuations in this active liquid crystal theory, again, in the absence of flows, which we believe is not important, one, one the active liquid crystal theory just reduces to this simple equation, where you have the change in the orientation is just re relaxation due to pneumatic, pneumatic elasticity, and then you have some active noise. And then one can analytically solve what these um, correlations in these deviations of, of, of orientation should be like. And so the intuition is as follows is that, you know, in a theory where things want to locally align, which is what these active liquid crystal theory is, then molecules near each other, if, if a microtubule at one location 
kind of deviates from the average. The nearby ones will deviate, uh, will deviate a lot. And what ones who are farther away kind of won't know about it and therefore they'll be kind of uncorrelated. So you expect the correlations to decrease with distance. It ends up for various reasons that looking at things as a function of distance isn't quite as nice as looking at them as a function of wavelength. And, and the, the, the same intuition is that it's very, it's easy to make long wavelength bends, but it's hard to make, you know, short wavelength bends where you kind of very radically like are, are altering things. And in fact, the, the, you can predict in this theory that the decrease in kind of, you know, the uh, orientational fluctuations goes like one over Q squared, where, where, where Q is a measure of this wavelength of these fluctuations. And then uh, Surya looked at the actual EM data. So um, so for every microtubule, he knows it's every, for the segment of every microtubule, he knows it's actual orientation. He can solve del squared N equals zero and get this kind of average orientation at every location. And therefore he can calculate this deviation from this average at every location. And then he can calculate this correlation function. And you can see that for the real you know, data in the spindle, it really does fall off like one over Q squared as the theory predicts. Similarly, he can look at density fluctuations in the spindle and predict how they fall off and density and director cross uh, of, of fluctuations. And then here, what the assumption is, is that in addition to microtools wanting to orient relative to each other, then they, they want to move, they want to grow and shrink and move along the direction they're pointing um, uh, and they turn over and they kind of have random motion. So that's what this equation here says. And so if one puts it all together, one can see that this is also con consistent with the data. All right, so this theory can explain collective fluctuations and, and the collective fluctuations in this middle is consistent with this active looking crystal theory as well, not just the averages. Now, another thing which, which Terry looked at as the following is that you might have noticed when I showed the EM reconstructions is that microtools in the spindle aren't straight, right? They're, 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 they're bent, right? This is actually a different issue than those kind of collective fluctuations. And so uh, we were, you know, we were curious is that can this framework also give insight to this bending of microtubules in the spindle? Well, from this active liquid crystal theory perspective, the way to think about this bending of microtubules is that you would think of any given microtubule, you could think of as some semi-flexible filament in this background of other microtubules, which are an active pneumatic. All right. And so it's like you can think of your microtubule your, that you happen to be looking at is just this filament in this background of, of aftermatic, which is our, all the other microtubules. All right. So, so, um, uh, Madan Rao, uh, Ramaswamy, and, and their collaborators have actually solved uh, uh, theories of a semi flexible filament and an pneumatic. And so you're kind of built off of that to ask, uh, look at the fluctuations. Um, 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 but this is very much following the work. And so if you consider, consider any given filament, so any given microtubule, you can fit it to a straight line uh, and then look at the deviation of the microtubules height away from that straight line. One can write down an equation that of, of how you expect that uh, that deviation to behave in, in this type of framework. And basically that deviation should want to relax because of, uh, due to the, the filament doesn't want to bend because it has some bending rigidity. Um, and it, it wants to kind of lie straight because it wants to align with the other microtubules in the spindle. And then you have deviations due to active stresses. And then um, uh, actually one can solve the, the, the spectrum of bending fluctuations uh, analytically um, uh, from this uh, theory. And um, in, you know, like in, uh, uh, in with certain parameters, uh, uh, those are predicted to fall off like one over Q squared. And then if you actually look at the bending fluctuations in the spindle, they really do fall off like one over Q squared. So the same active pneumatic um, uh, theory can explain, in fact, the statistics of microtubule bending um, uh, throughout the spindle. Now, that's very interesting, um, um, I would argue. Um, and because in this theory, it says basically the microtubule bends are ultimately due to active stress fluctuations. What do I mean by that? I mean, actually, like, if you, it ends up, this is just, it just ends up, I would say, that the statistics of these bends have the same spectrum as you would get even for thermal fluctuations, but the amplitude of the bends are, are much, much more. They have the same spectrum, but different amplitude. In other words, like, if you have, look at real microtubules, or microtubules bend fluctuating in solution by themselves, you have a persistence length of roughly a, a, a millimeter, 
the microtubules in the spindle have the same spectrum of fluctuations, but the apparent persistence length is just around 10 microns. Now, the idea is that the microtubules actually, in reality, have the same rigidity, but according to this theory, um, um, th those bends are just more because of the act additional active uh, stresses that are in the spindle. Now, um, if you believe that theory, which you should, um, that suggests that microtubule bends you could think of as really doing, you know, essentially being internal force sensors, and then you can use them to actually probe essentially forces in the in the spindle. And then one can ask kind of more sophisticated questions, like for example, sorry, I compared the bending of kinetochore and non-kinetochore microtubules, and very interestingly, they look very very similar, which argues that for most of that along their lengths, the forces on them are actually quite similar which is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, but at the same time is consistent with work from other people. Um, um, and then for example, uh, so you can look at uh, bends uh, at different locations in the spindle. And he sees actually the bend, the spectrum of bends for microtubules near the center of the spindle near the pole are actually quite similar, um, which perhaps surprisingly suggests that they're um, subject to quite similar forces at different, um, even though they're in different locations in the spindle. All right, now that's fantastic. I think, in my personal opinion, it's fantastic. But but one could argue it's a little bit indirect because you're just looking at static stuff, and so we're trying to also do more active mechanical measurements of the spindle. And Maya, who's a graduate student in the lab, uh, she's been um, um, uh, getting magnetic beads into human tissue culture cells and putting them inside the spindle, and then can use that to exert forces and therefore directly measure the rheology of the spindle. And so, for example, the rheology of, there's a typo here, but the, okay, the second line is correct. The, the rheology of the, uh, the, the apparent viscosity of the spindle, oh yeah, to, so to a first approximation, the spindle appears to be mostly viscous um, with very little uh, overall uh, elasticity with the rheology that's roughly a thousand times greater than cytoplasm. And she's, doing, she's exploring this in much more detail um, and uh, with the ultimate goal of hoping to do um, you know, attach beads to chromosomes and also look at mechanics of chromosome segregation. All right, so so in summary, all right, so the, uh, a very simple active local crystal theory uh, uh, can quantitatively explain uh, the shape of the spindle, the uh, the scaling of the spindle, uh, the orientation of microtubules throughout the spindle, the collective fluctuations of microtubules in the spindle, and the bending of microtubules um, um, in the spindle. And this is really the heart of this type of theory. This is, you could think of it this way, it's essentially the simplest theory you could possibly write down where um, everything is just determined by the local interaction of microtubules with each other due to cross-linkers and uh, molecular motors. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dan, that was a fascinating talk. Uh... So uh, we have right now one question in the chat. Let me ask that. Uh, so regarding the spindle morphology, does the position of the defects correspond to the minimum of the free energy? Yeah, so we're looking at that right now. And um, okay, so this is still work in progress. So we don't really know for sure. Um, I think that the answer is no, um, but 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 we need to look at that in more detail. And so, and so I think that I'll just say what I'm, my, my current speculation is, is that the theory, which, which here we use to describe everything, uh, or, or most things, uh, uh, is, oh, no, okay, sorry, let, let me rephrase that. This theory is a pneumatic theory, um, um, and it says that the, uh, but there's also a polarity in it, right? So the microtubules are both, um, you know, they're, they're polar, right? Um, and I suspect what one needs to have is stresses that are related to the polarity. Uh, and that's not stuff which we have in the current version of stuff. But I, but I suspect that that will be important for uh, pr properly, uh, or for really understanding the location of those defects. So I had a question about your blend fl bend fluctuations versus the pneumatic fluctuations. Aren't they kind of similar? Or uh, am I sort of not thinking of it correctly? Um, yeah, and so and so uh, there they are different things, right? And so like um, uh, so you could have, let's phrase it this way, a bunch of short filaments always perfectly straight, yet still have director fluctuations. Mm -hmm. okay. right. And so and so those are connected, but they're really different things. or or, or they maybe could be connected, but they're really different things conceptually. Mm -hmm. 
so Joe, Joe has a question for you. Joe, do you want to unmute and just ask? Yep. Uh, hi, Dan. Um, great talk. But my question is, I mean, is there a light microscope evidence that the that the microtubules are as bent as as you see in the um, electron microscopy? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. So, so the the amount that they're bent is not sting. One should really, it, it's very hard to resolve that from light microscopy. And so, what we're trying to do to, um, okay, so so we, okay, we have one indirect piece of evidence that the bends are probably real and not a, uh, you know, EM artifact, and that is that. Um, different perturbations can change the bends. And so like, you know, like uh, you have different bends when you inhibit kinesin five, for example, right? Uh, so that's one argument that 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 they're, that they're uh, uh, probably real, um, but, but we're still kind of concerned about that. So what we plan on doing is as follows, is that basically by looking at the statistics of bending, then you can estimate what the stress, what you can calculate in this theory, what the stress fluctuations are. Um, you know, if you believe the theory. All right. Then from the these beat experiments, we have these active measurements. If we also, if Maya is planning to do the following, just put beats in the spindle, just track their motion by comparing the active, uh, you know, the active and passive rheology of the beads, she should also be able to measure the spectrum of, of, of stress fluctuations. And then the question is, are those two uh, measurements from the microreology and from the microtubule bending uh, in agreement. And if they are, then I think that would give us a lot of confidence that this is uh, really, really right. 